from Music City, USA, it's David Hooper and Music Business Radio. From the TuneIn Broadcasting Studios in Nashville, Tennessee, this is Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music business. I'm David Hooper, your host. With me today, Bill Katniss. He's a performance coach, media consultant, and show doctor. He works with actors, politicians, athletes, doctors, performers, and musicians on interview techniques, body language, storytelling, much more. He's got a lot of great stories, too, from over 30 years in the entertainment business. Bill Katniss, welcome to Music Business Radio. David, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I appreciate that. So excited to have you here, and I'm going to let you explain what you do, because you can do it better than I can. Well, if it's on stage at a podium in front of a camera, I either develop it, I enhance it, or I fix it. So people usually call me to either create something from whole cloth or if something, somebody is having a problem with their performance or their speaking or what have you, I get in there and I figure out what the problem is and we solve it. Give me a quick story of you in action. <laughs> well, I work with a lot of young people, a lot of young performers. I will get music companies or uh, publishing companies to have me work with these uh, young performers who just come into town. And many times they've spent 20 years sitting on their bed in their bedroom learning how to play a song, learning how to sing, writing, but they haven't spent any time actually learning how to speak to an audience, how to speak to reporters, how to speak to journalists, how to deal with an event where they meet people at a party. So they'll call me in and I'll work with these people. And uh, this one story, this young guy, great artist, wonderful voice, very nice guy, was going to do a radio tour. And a radio tour is where they take the performer to different radio stations around the country. They have them meet the general manager, the staff. They'll sit down in a room with all of these people, pick up their guitar, play a few songs. If everybody likes everybody, hopefully when their uh, record comes out, that radio station will play their music. So I'll mock up these sessions. In this case, I had a lawyer at his uh, his office in his conference room. He played the GM. His staff played the staff. This kid comes in. He sits down. He picks up his, his guitar. He looks at everybody. And the first thing he says to them is, two Polacks walk into a bar. And he tells this joke. And it's a Polish joke. And everybody in the room is appalled, of course. Afterwards, I sit down with him and his management. I said, look. If you're going to upset everybody in the room, let me give you a racist joke that's up to date, because that's a 50s joke. And of course, I'm joking with them, but I'm trying to get them to understand. And this this poor kid said, yeah, but my father loves that joke. I said, yeah, well, your father's not in the room. So these are the kinds of things that I, I do. So this guy was just doing his natural way of building rapport wherever he came from and Sometimes that doesn't always translate. Well, many times it doesn't translate. Yeah, your family loves your humor, and they think you're wonderful, but your family is not the one that's going to hire you, pay you, or take you on as a client. So they have to learn a whole different way of thinking. So how did you get involved in this business? I know you've worked both sides of the camera. Wow. How did I get involved? I was an actor from the time I was six years old, and I worked in stage, and I worked in television, I worked in film, and somewhere in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, I was teaching at the Beverly Hills Playhouse in Los Angeles, and I was also doing a, a soap opera at the time. And I was doing those two things back to back, and I was burning candle at both ends, and it was getting difficult, and I had to decide what I enjoyed most. And although acting, I, I made good money at it, I didn't enjoy it as much as coaching, teaching, directing. That's where I had the most fun. And uh, one day, I actually worked with a guy. His name was Kenny Norton. He was the heavyweight champion of the world at the time. And Kenny had just done a film called Mandingo. And right after this film, Kenny's management said, you know, Kenny, acting classes might not be a bad thing. <laughs> so I start working with Kenny. And at the same time, Kenny's getting ready to defend his title. And he came in one day and he looked like somebody just taking a bat and beating him. I said, Kenny, where have you been? And he said, well, I was just uh, sparring, getting ready for this. And I said, Kenny, what's the hardest thing about winning? And I thought Kenny was going to say, well, you know, getting my head beaten in every day, not seeing my kids for weeks at a time. And Kenny looked at me and he said something I'll never forget. He said, once you win, you're not allowed to lose. Now, coming from Kenny, that was pretty heady. And I said, well, then, Kenny, why do you do it? And then Kenny did his Kenny thing. He said, hey, baby, it's what I do. I win. It's what I do. But I learned from that moment on that a lot of these people that I work with, that have been doing it for a while, they did something stellar early on in their career, and they spend the rest of their life chasing after it. So one of the things that I try to help them do is to let go of that 
and work on what's ahead of them instead of worrying about what was behind them. And Kenny was one of those guys. Sweet, sweet man. He just passed away recently, but he was a, he was a very nice man. You're listening to Music Business Radio. Bill Kakmus is my guest today. He's a performance coach, media consultant, and show doctor. We have a lot of musicians listening, and every one of them I know is thinking, well, I've got good songs. I don't need this. So my question to you, is music enough? Music, <laughs> especially country music, is not enough. Now, you need great music. You need great material, obviously. It's like Shakespeare. But if you have bad actors do Shakespeare, guess what? It ain't Shakespeare anymore. So it's not just about having great material, especially in country music. It's about your relationship with your fans because fans if they have a great relationship with that artist they'll buy their music even if some of the music isn't as top-notch as some of their other music but they love them so much that it transfers to what they're listening to so a lot of these especially younger artists that i work with uh, we have to uh, help them to understand that just because you have a good song you still have to have a relationship with that audience whether it's on the radio and doing an interview whether it's on stage whether it's at a party, you've got to keep that persona and you've got to keep it level all the way through so that people know and understand that they're not only buying your music, they're buying who you are as a human being. I'm sure you've probably noticed this. When somebody gets on stage for the first time, they seem to think that the little bitty movements that they're doing are exaggerated. They think they're doing more than they are. Right. And do you see that also with personality, that upcoming artists think that the little bitty bit of personality that they've got on stage is being reflected in a big way? Artists have very specific characteristics. Some are over the top and you have to tamp them down. Others hardly do anything and you have to pull anything that they've got out of them. They all think, or most of them at least, think that what they do is perfect because it feels right to them. But many times what feels right doesn't look right. So over the years, I found that the people that I work with whose roots are closer to the equator have bigger movements, bigger body language. The closer their roots get to the Netherlands, uh, up into the poles, the closer their body language is and the smaller it is. So many times I'm having to pull in people that are hot-blooded, and I have to get people who are cold-blooded to have a bit more energy. Many times what I have to do is I have to actually tape them or record them on, on video and show them. And then I'll ask them first, what did you think you did? How big did you think you go? Did you know you did this or did you know you didn't do that? And they think they've done it. Then I'll show it to them and they'll go, wow, I didn't do it. It felt like I did it. So many times I have to show them those areas and then they have to realize that although it's going to feel uncomfortable to them, once they do that movement, that gesture, that expression, I have to show them that. They'll take a look at it and they'll go, you know what, that felt awful, but it looks great. I've worked with a lot of kids that are going to audition for American Idol, The Voice, The X Factor, and there are many times that this is the situation because they've had family and friends tell them that they're wonderful, but then in reality, they may be talented, but their talent is usually much smaller than it needs to be in front of those judges. Can you talk more about that? The first thing you do, I guess, is put a video camera in front of them so they can actually see themselves. And, and, and then what? How do you approach them? Because I imagine some people don't like to change. They think they're just fine. Well... If I'm in that room, somebody thinks they're not fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the first thing I will do is, is not put a camera in front of them because as soon as a camera or a microphone is in front of somebody, suddenly they're acting differently. The first thing I will do is have them do what they normally do. Just show me what you got. Show me what you're going to do for those judges or for that recording company, for that client, whomever. Show me that. I'll take notes. Then I'll sit down and talk to you about it. There are some people who can listen, process, and immediately do what I'm suggesting that they do. There are other people that look at me and they go, you're crazy. I don't do that. Or I don't need to do that. That's when I bring out the camera, uh, is when I have to actually show them because they can't see it themselves. I always go on the talent or the, the performer first. I don't go to the camera first. At that point, do you get any resistance? 90% of what I do gets resistance. <laughs> Because, like I said, very rarely am I hired by the person I'm working with. Usually, I'm hired by a studio. I'm hired by a production company. I'm hired by a manager, an agent. 
Rarely am I hired by the person. Occasionally I am. I just finished working with uh, Cara Diaguardi, who was uh, a judge on American Idol a few years ago. Wonderful woman and incredible songwriter. Great voice. She just wrote a book, and she wants to go on tour, and she wants to take the stories that she wrote in the book, connect them to her music, her songs that she's written, and she wanted to put together a show. And she wanted to structure a show that would be clean, it had a beginning, middle, and end, it had a climax, it would do all the things a show does. And she didn't know how to do that, because that's not her expertise, so we sat down and we did that. But that's one of the very few times that an artist would actually call me. Usually, a year and a half ago, I got called to fly a thousand miles to talk a guy out of a trailer on a movie set. He wouldn't come out of his trailer. No. That, that's a story you've got to go into. <laughs> <laughs> um, the man in question, the actor in question, there are only seven guys on the planet that can open a film at any one time. There are only seven guys. Without these guys, there's no film. Of course, these guys make a ton of money, right? So this guy wasn't coming out of his trailer. He was aggravated about something. Every hour that a movie sits there and does nothing, it's $100,000. Gone. Gone. So they decided it was cheaper because that man could have sat in that RV for days. These things are set up, so they live there, right? So they figured it was cheaper to fly me first class a 1,000 miles to get there and talk him out of his trailer than it would be to sit there for days. So I get there, I knock on the door, and I hear, go away. I said, hey, it's Cacmus. He said, Bill, what are you doing here? I said, let me in. So the guy lets me in, and I looked at him. I said, what is going on? He looked at me and said, have you seen the script? I said, am I in this movie? How would I know this script? He said, take a look at this. So I, I looked at the scene and I said, okay, you're about to do a scene, a love scene with one of the most beautiful women on the planet. You're going to get paid today more money than I will ever see. What's your problem? And he looked at me and he said, she's a, and then he called her a name that I can't say on the radio. So they're having a spat. And because they're having a spat, He's not coming out because he needs an apology. So I have to talk him down. I have to go and talk her down. And then I have to go to the director and say, look, if you're going to direct this scene, just understand. And he looked at me and he said, look, I'm going to direct the way I want to direct. I said, you, you flew me here. You're going to do this. You're going to take, do 100 takes on this. Do the first one the way I'm suggesting. Because they need a little time to settle their little differences. And trust me, in an hour, you're going to get exactly what you want. So in four hours, I dealt with the situation. I got on a plane. I went away. That's the kind of stuff I get uh, once a month. (laughs) You're a problem solver, Bill. (laughs) Sometimes. We're going to take a break. But when we come back, I want to talk to you about one of the problems that I see a lot. It's that artists don't have good media training. So we're going to give some tips on what they can do to get better at handling the media and those tricky PR problems and tough questions the media sometimes throws out. Bill Cagnus is my guest today. He's a performance coach, media consultant, and show doctor. More from Bill when we come back on Music Business Radio. Hey, this is Emerson Hart from Tonic, and you're listening to Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the biz. When you're finished shopping for everyone else, treat yourself to the Christmas Eve Day Brunch at Mason's in the Lowe's Vanderbilt. Only $30 for adults and parking's free. Bring in Christmas Eve in style at Mason's inside the Lowe's Vanderbilt from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. For reservations, call 321-1990 or visit opentable.com. Hi, this is Vance Joy, and you're listening to Music Business Radio. From Nashville, Tennessee, this is Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music business. I'm David Hooper, your host. With me today, Bill Cagmus. He's a performance coach, media consultant, and show doctor. He works with actors, politicians, athletes, doctors, and performers, also musicians. And Bill, I'm going to get into some specific advice in this section. And because you work with politicians, I know that you're good at this. Let's talk about media situations that an artist might get into. I had a company here in town who works with Christian artists. In fact, their whole, their whole deal is for Christian artists. And I've worked with many Christian artists over the years. This one Christian artist had just come off of American Idol. And when you're either a finalist or you win American Idol, you have to do, at least for a year, what they tell you to do. Whatever record album they want you to come out with, that's what you're coming out with. With this particular artist, who is, like I said, a Christian artist, 
they wanted him to do a country record, and he, although didn't feel real comfortable about doing that, he's, he was a good singer, and he said, fine. So for a year, he did country music. Well, at the end of that year, he wanted to do Christian. Well, suddenly, he's getting a lot of flack from reporters and journalists. Why are you turning your back on country music? Well, this is getting this kid upset. And so in interviews, he's getting hot-headed. He's talking back at him. It's not pretty. So the company calls me in and says, we need to fix this because this guy's going to keep getting this question. So I sat down with him and his management. And I get a lot of these, we need something fixed. We need something done because we're, go- we're going into a rabbit hole here. So I sat down with him and his management, and I, I looked at this kid, and I said, uh, isn't your grandfather, wasn't your grandfather a music minister? He said, yes. I said, isn't your dad a music minister? He said, well, yeah. I said, aren't you a music minister? He said, yes. I said, so you're not turning your back on anything. You're embracing something that you have had your entire life. And guess what? Country music gave you the opportunity to do the thing you love most in life. Isn't that cool? And sudden, and they're all looking at me, and they're all saying, why didn't we think of that? <laughs> but I get the job to come in and quickly fix a problem that's turning into a nightmare. Is there any time when getting hot-headed, as you say, does that ever work out? Rarely. It doesn't work out because it looks like you've caught the person in either a lie or they apparently they've done something wrong. And usually people get angry and out of control when they know, either consciously or subconsciously, they got caught with their hand in a cookie jar. So what I try to train people to do or what I train people to do is to go in with the full knowledge that they're not going to ask you what you want them to ask you. They're going to ask you questions to see if they can get you off guard, if they can get you off balance. That's their job. So instead of getting mad, what you need to do is know and understand what your agenda is, and no matter the question, get to the point you needed to get to. Politicians are great at this, and this is why we hate them. It's because you can ask them about dirt, and at the end of the day, they're going to turn it around somehow and finish their answer with their agenda, whatever their agenda was, usually having nothing to do with what you asked them in the first place. I see politicians do that a lot, Bill. There'll be some kind of crisis, a government shutdown or a war, and the politician will take it right back to the economy. Right. Or gay marriage, right. or whatever it is on their agenda. Right. Is, is that the way to handle that? It's the way you have to handle it if you don't want to talk about a certain thing. Now, I am not a proponent of lying, and I'm not a proponent of misguiding people. However, if it were up to me, I tell them just to say, I'm not going there. I'm not talking about that subject for whatever reason. The reason I'm here is to talk about so-and-so and such-and-such. And such. However, politicians who want to be voted in again and again, they try to f- make sure that the viewer thinks that they know all, they see all, they're happy with all, and they don't want you to realize that they've actually sidestepped a question. So that's the difference between a politician. Uh, the politicians that we – not that there are many of them around – but the politicians or the communicators that we love are the ones that will take responsibility – If something has happened, the ones that will say, you know what, I don't have an answer for that right now, but I will get that answer or I will do what it takes to make sure that this uh, this gets answered to the public's uh, or to your satisfaction. Those are the communicators that we love, the ones that we feel they care that we're getting the truth. How have things like YouTube, where these videos that are on television can be played again and again, or even if it's a personal appearance, like a stage performance, can be videotaped and put up where it's played and played again, and people can comment on it, how has that changed all of this? Well, it's just changed it in that performers especially, I talk to them all the time about from the time they walk out of the door of their home to the time they get home, they need to be the person that they want their audience to understand, to know, respect, and to have a relationship with. You have to be that person if you're in the store buying groceries, if you're parking your car, if you're at the bank, you got to be that person. And it's the most difficult thing. Now, I'm not saying to lie or to be somebody else. Let me tell you a quick story, if you don't mind. Years ago, Dick Clark asked me to come to Nashville. This was in the mid-90s to work with a host 
that he had doing a show he was producing here for TNN called Primetime Country. And he called me, Dick called me, and I, as I said, I, I get this once a month. I, I get a producer who calls me and say, says, I have a host problem. He had a host problem. So I said, what's your problem? And, and Dick said, you just going to have to meet this guy. So I come in, and I see that the show needs better writing. It needs to be shot better. He needs to be having wearing different clothes. But also, this guy wasn't acting the way we feel hosts need to act on, on stage, talking to the audience, with his guests. He was being who he normally is in life. Well, the, normally in life, he would sit down before the woman would sit down. He would do things like that. He would call women honey. Well, you can't do that on a national talk show and get away with it, not as the host. So these were things that I figured, okay, I need to talk to this guy about. Well, when Dick introduced me to him, turned around and walked out of the room, I hadn't said two words to this, this gentleman. And this guy looked at me and said, just to let you know, I'm not changing. And I said, what do you mean you're not changing? And he looked at me. He said, I like, he pointed to himself, and I'll use the name Joe Schmo. He said, I like Joe Schmo, and Joe Schmo isn't changing. I went, oh. I said, so I guess we're done. He said, I guess we are. So I turned around to walk out, and I said, I turned back to him. I said, you know, you could have told Dick this yourself. He said, you go and tell him. So I said, just so that I can be clear before I go and tell Dick Clark that we're not going to be working together since he flew me here to work with you. When you say you like Joe Schmo and you don't want Joe Schmo to change, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not even understanding what that means. I said, which Joe Schmo are you talking about? And he said, the Joe Schmo sitting in front of you. I said, yeah, I get that. But do you speak the same way to your wife that you do to Dick? He said, no. I said, do you speak the same way to Dick you do to your children? He said, no. I said, so which one of those is the lie and which one of those is the real Joe Schmo? He said, they're all me. I said, I, I don't get that. He said, you change who you are, depending on who you're talking to, to succeed in that situation. I said, that's right. I'm not here to make you somebody else. I'm trying to find the best Joe Schmo possible for this show. I'm trying to find those characteristics of you that work best for this host. Those are the ones that you have to show. Those other ones we want to diminish for the time being. The ones that you would diminish in front of a woman that you might not diminish in front of your poker buddies. But I said, you know what? You're right. We're done. And I turned around to walk out, and this guy went, well, wait a minute. And then I worked with him for the next four years. So <laughs> this is an idea of, of getting people to use those characteristics that who they are that are truthful but make up the person that needs to show themselves to their, their viewers. I love that because I think a lot of people feel like they're changing – and they don't want to, and we're really all changing, depending on which circumstance we're well, in. Well, you can't be – there are thousands of elements that make up who we are. We can't be them all at the same time. So part of my job as a coach is to find those characteristics that are right for the, that performance or for that persona – help you to capitalize on those and then find those characteristics that don't work really well for that persona or that, that performance and we'll find a way to diminish those. So at the end of the day, I don't want you to act like somebody you're not. I just want you to be the best you possible for that particular performance. This is Music Business Radio from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm David Hooper. With me today, Bill Cagmus. He's a performance coach, media consultant, and show doctor. You're the man that puts out fires. Wherever there's smoke, they call you in. Yep, they're firemen and they're farmers, and sometimes I do both. Sometimes I, I help plant things, and sometimes I put out fire. How about meet and greets? That's something that we're seeing a lot more with artists just having to literally get out and pound the pavement. How do you keep up that energy when everybody has their persona in their head of who you are? You're asking me to divulge a secret here, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell you something that is the secret of the universe. And if you know this, everything else will come. Now, I'm going to tell you, and you got to promise not to say anything, Danny. <laughs> just between us, Bill. It's just between us. Now, it's something that people really, if they understood it, it would change their life. And I'm writing a book right now with this, this title. It's not about you. It's not about you. 
when people go to events to meet and greets and to those kinds of things, many times the reason that they get nervous, the reason that they uh, glitch, the reason that they don't act the way they should is because they're trying to put out this thing that they think people want. If you think about it, the only times in life when we get really nervous and we're not ourselves is when we are on a job interview or a date. Because we're trying to get people to like us. And so we're doing things we wouldn't normally do when we're with our friends. It's all inflow. It's not outflow. So in life, if these people know how to meet and greet, and I try to get them to go into these things thinking, look, your only job is to make those people feel like they're special, like they're the only thing on the planet and that you care about them and that you want to know about them and it's about them. If you can do that, people will love you. If it's about you, people will hate you. <laughs> it's unfortunate, but it's true. So I know we, we talked about this uh, in, in before we started this the show, but I told you that I'm working with an NFL player here in town and uh, I talked to the coach, and one of the things he was telling me was that 93% of their career is practice. The game's nothing to these guys, because when they get on the field, they can't be thinking about technique. They have to be just open to the experience, and all of their talent has to flow. But to do that, they have to practice so much, they have to gain so much technique that all of their talent shows itself. Now, here's the thing about performers. Here's the thing about any kind of a craftsman. There are two parts to a craftsman. There's talent and there's technique. Talent is God-given. You can't buy it. You can't find it. Nobody can give you talent. You can't grow talent. You're either born with it or you're not. Some people have a lot. Some people have a little. But at the end of the day, you got what you got. You're not born with technique. You've got nothing. So when you're born, from the time you're born until the time you perform, you want to pull in as much technique as possible because the more technique you have, the more it supports the talent and the talent will show itself. I'm not in business to give people talent. I can't. And people ask me all the time, am I talented enough? And my answer is, do you have enough technique to show the talent you've got? Because at the end of the day, there are people who are incredibly talented, and you go, whatever happened to their career? And there are other people who are marginally talented, but man, they got a career forever because they got so much technique that all of their talent shows itself, and it's consistent. And consistency in our business is everything. So it's all about prep. It's all about consistency. And it's all about the idea that it's not about you. It's about the people you're talking to. Good advice. Bill Cagmus is here. He's a performance coach, media consultant, and show doctor. This is Music Business Radio. I'm your host, David Hooper. We'll have more from Bill when we come back. I see you now. It's right over in the left to right. Hey, this is Wild Cub, and you're listening to Music Business Radio. Want to know why we had to start our own record label? Because we want to actually make some money. It's the holiday season. Time to wrap those presents, grab your favorite ugly Christmas sweater, and enjoy all the festivities with your loved ones. Grand Avenue is here to ensure that you always get home safely after the celebration. Whether attending a party around town or at your best friend's home, book your ride and enjoy that extra glass of eggnog. Family in town? Why not start a new tradition and book Grand Avenue Holiday Lights Tour? Sit back, relax, enjoy a glass of hot apple cider, and check out the beautiful light displays here in Music City. And be sure to let Grand Avenue know if you'd rather have the Grinch or It's a Wonderful Life on that flat screen TV inside your vehicle. Grand Avenue is also donating a toy for Toys for Tots of Middle Tennessee for every tour booked. Holiday Light Tour is available for a limited time only. Call them up at 615-714-5466 or online at GrandAvenueWorldwide.com. Grand Avenue. Be driven. Hey, this is Ricky from the Wild Feathers. You're listening to Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the biz. From the TuneIn Broadcasting Studios, it's Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music business. Bill Cagmus is my guest today. He's a performance coach, media consultant, and show doctor. We've been talking about technique versus talent. Bill, I love the quote you have here. Or it's a quote now, because I'm <laughs> quoting you. Do you have enough technique to show the talent you've got? Right. Let's, let's dive more into that. I'll work with a lot of people who are 
they may have been great or they may be great in one area like they'll take a songwriter who was or a, uh, a personality who was fantastic and, and made a name for themselves and suddenly now they have to be a show host well they don't have the technique to be a show host they think their talent is enough just to transfer it from being a singer to suddenly being a show host well there is a technique to reading a prompter. There's a technique to standing up and doing a monologue. There's a technique to how you interview guests. And if you're thinking too much about the technique, your talent doesn't show itself. So there are many performers that I have to teach, and they will go kicking and screaming, but I have to teach them how to actually listen to someone talk and be motivated by what they've said to ask the next question instead of many times these people they're not even listening to the person who they've asked the question they're just ready for their next their next question to that person and so many times they'll ask something that's just been answered so there are performers that I've had to work with and over time once they get the technique suddenly the talent that they had that they were hired for begins to show itself again and it happens many times, especially with hosts, because many hosts were first something else. How do you teach somebody to listen? That's a question women have asked throughout right, the ages. Right, exactly. Uh, and, you know, interestingly enough, many times I have to get somebody out of their own way to do their job. There are many times, in fact, that's a, that, brings up, that brings up a story about this host that Dick Clark had me working with. And there was one point he was having a bad time in his marriage and it was affecting his work and he came in one day right before he's doing a show and he was beside himself and i said what happened he said well i was having words with my my wife and i said something i probably shouldn't have said i said what did you say and he said well she was talking and i said yes they will do that and he said well she just kept talking and finally i said listen i talk when i have something to say you talk until you have something to say and I said, okay, you, you do know that that's the beginning of the end of a marriage. You do know that, right? However, with many of these people, what I have to do to teach them to listen is I will sit down with them and I will say, You're, we're going to do an interview, but you have no questions in front of you. There's certain things that I'm going to tell you you need to find out, but the questions you have have got to be related to whatever I say to you. So I'm going to start talking. And until you find a way to be motivated by what I've just said to you, and to turn that into your next question, you're going to have to listen. So it forces them to listen to me to figure out what I'm saying so that they can, they can turn that and motivate that to, to support whatever the next question is. It's a hard thing to do, as you know, and you're very good at it. But there are a lot of people who just – they were hired because of their talent, not because they know how to listen. Well, I appreciate that, and that's why I'm going to ask the next follow-up because I kind of had this interview sketched out with you. But – it doesn't matter because everything is based on the next thing that you say, and we go down like a lot of rabbit trails. So right. it's terrifying to go into an interview without any kind of prep. It's a nice crutch to have some questions laid out. I always tell hosts that I work with the old line about hope for the best, plan for the worst, right? So you need to walk in with an agenda, but that agenda should only be used if the interviewee isn't available, they're not answering questions fully, they don't know where they're going, you always have a place to go. That's what your agenda is about as, as, as an interviewer. However, you have to recognize if you're working with somebody, if you're interviewing somebody who's a great interview, like me. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, you made it very easy, I, I will admit. But if you're working with somebody who has stories and has a personality and has an energy, man, you ride the tide. So, yes, you have an agenda and you've got to hit your brakes and those kinds of things. But at the same time, if you're very good at what you do, it's all motivated by the person who's sitting in front of you. You're listening to Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music business. I'm with Bill Cagmus today. He's a performance coach, media consultant, and show doctor. We're talking about the interviewer. How about the interviewee? Should they just go in unprepared? No, they shouldn't go in unprepared. They should certainly have an agenda and things that they want to talk about. However, they need to know and understand the environment they're walking into and make sure that they allow that environment to do what it's supposed to do. I had one couple, singers, a, a duo, they weren't doing well in their radio interviews, and they came to me and asked me to help them. So I had them videotape an interview, a radio interview, which obviously you would never see, but we sat down together and watched the way that they would sit down with a, a DJ 
and answer questions. What we found is that they walked into that radio station and all they wanted to talk about is their song. And the DJ would want to find out about them and they would just turn it right back on, on the song. And I had to sit down with them and say, guys, it's a radio station. They're going to play your song. So don't worry about that. Your job is to go in there and create a relationship with your listener. If you create that relationship, they'll want to hear your music. If it's just about your music, then they're not going to care about you. So the interviewee needs to know and understand what the agenda is. And many times the agenda is it's not about you. It's not about your song. It's about your listener. How do you create a relationship with them? What are the things that you're going to say to connect with them on a level that then they will want to hear your music because it makes sense? Do you have any suggestions on how an artist could do that? Because I feel like a lot of the artists that I've interviewed, the reason they act that way toward the music is because they have nothing to say or they're nervous. If you walk in knowing who your listener is, as you know, every radio station has its target audience. There are the 25 to 54-year-old women. There are the stations that are just about sports sportsmen. There are stations that are just about rockers, and they're in their younger set. So you need to go in and know the listener. Once you know and understand the listener, your story, we've all had a story we've told a 100 times. We have a family story that we've told so many times that our significant other, as soon as we start to tell that story to party, they'll look at everybody and go, I'm going to go into the next room. This is a great story. I'll be back in about 10 minutes, right? And you will tell that story differently to your parents' friends than you would to your friends, than you would to a younger generation or an older generation or a man or a woman. It's the same story. But we know it's not about the story. It's about who we're talking to. So we will change the story, not the truth of it, but we will change the parts that we highlight based on our knowledge of what that listener enjoys, appreciates, and has a reality for. And so the smartest thing to do as an artist is to know your listener. Once you know your listener, you can start to relate your stories in their point of view, not your point of view. So know your audience. The all ages comedy act is different from the 21 and over. I ask many times when I first sit down with a performer, especially a one who's just starting out in the business, I'll ask, who's your audience? And they'll say to me, everybody. Well, that's impossible. It just is. You know, you can, it's the Lincoln line. You can please some of the people some of the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. And it's the same with an artist. As soon as they think it's for everybody, I am talking to everybody, guess what? You're talking to nobody. You have to know your audience and speak specifically to that group. If you do that, you're going to get the people around them. But if you just speak to the periphery, you're never going to get that main audience and you're not going to succeed. You're listening to Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music business. I'm David Hooper, your host. With me today, Bill Cagmus. He's a performance coach, media consultant, and show doctor. We've been listening to stories from his over 30 years in the entertainment business. Bill, when we come back, I've got to ask you about fear of public performance. I know it scares a lot of artists listening. That's next from Bill Cagmus on Music Business Radio. So Neela from the Lumineers, you're listening to Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music biz. Voted the best neighborhood bar four years in a row, ML Rose presents just one of the Kraft Burger creations on the new ML Rose menu. What do you know about the Angry Dragon? Featuring an all-beef cast with fresh avocado, egg, and a very special guest, Sriracha Hot. Certified Angus beef that is 100% hormone and antibiotic-free and never frozen. Creamy avocado, local sourced Willow Farm egg, and Sriracha Hot. A deadly combination of sun-ripened chilies and garlic. This is no ordinary burger. This is the Angry Dragon. I'm hoping you'll join us at ML Rose. You want me to join you? Just when you think you've broken free, you'll find there's no escape from the Angry Dragon. Savor enough Kraft Burger Productions from the masters at ML Rose. Then choose from ML Rose's large selection of the best local and craft beers on tap. Lunch, dinner, and late night. Seven days a week, two locations. The original ML Rose on Franklin Road and ML Rose West on Charlotte Avenue near Sylvan Park. 21 and up after 5 p.m. Learn more by visiting MLRose.com or on Twitter at underscore ML Rose. <laughs> Hey, this 
This is Courtney J, and you're listening to Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the biz. From Nashville, Tennessee, it's Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music business. I'm David Hooper, your host, and with me today, Bill Kakmus. He's a performance coach, media consultant, and show doctor. Bill, a lot of people are scared to get up in public and make a speech. They say it's above dying. Uh, yes. Dying is apparently the second thing that people fear the most. Public speaking is the first. And it made one comedian actually say in his stand-up that what that tells everyone, that people would rather be in the coffin than doing the eulogy. <laughs> 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 so it's true that uh, public speaking is nerve-wracking. And as I said earlier, the reason it's nerve-wracking is because when people stand up to speak publicly, they're so concerned about how they look, how they sound, how they're acting, how people are perceiving them. That's where many of those nerves come from. So one of the things that I get people to do is, is think about the – it's about the audience. It's not about them. It's learning and understanding the audience. And it's making sure that when you're speaking, you're really connecting with those people. The other thing, too, is nerves come from the unknown. People aren't used to doing this. They get up one time, and it gets it's nerve-wracking, and so they don't want to do it again. So part of nerves is having to do it over and over again. So I always, I always get people to rehearse. Something I've found that's really interesting, speaking of doing it over and over again, when I'm dealing with an artist, sometimes they're more comfortable on stage than they are speaking to people one-on-one. -on -one. So surely you can get on stage if you're nervous. Do you see what I mean? I understand what you're saying. Interestingly enough, however, I've, I've worked with many artists. I worked with Lance Bass, who was part of InSync, And after InSync broke up, he wanted to go on a speaking tour. And he hired me, and I sat down with him. And he said to me, you know, it's interesting. I can sing in front of 50,000 people. I can't speak in front of 20. So he needed help to be able to transfer his talent as a singer into the ability to speak. It's difficult. You know, because it's about yourself. Singing, sometimes these artists can get into the persona that they've created through that song. When you're speaking, there's no song to hide behind. So sometimes, as we were talking about, some people have one skill or the other. I see a lot of singers as well that can sing but can't even talk in between songs. Even for 20 seconds, what do you suggest for them? Well, many times the reason they can't speak in between songs is they haven't thought about what they're going to say. They think it's just going to happen when they stand in front of an audience, and that's not the case. It's interesting. The reason they're so good with the song is because they've sung it a thousand times, and they're, they're confident in it because they know exactly what's going to happen. When they speak, they have no idea what they're going to say, and of course they're going to falter. And so what they end up doing is saying the same stuff you hear over and over again. Again. Hey, how is everybody tonight? Love New York. And they'll talk about that. And they want, they're, they're provoking an audience to applaud because they've got nothing to say. So one of the things that I will do with a performer is I'll listen to their songs and how they're structuring that show and help them to write a sinew to come up with basically what they want to say to get us from one song to the next. Then... And they rehearse it just like their music so that they rehearse a whole show from front to back, not just their music. And I let them know that, look, once you're out there, if the audience takes you to another place, great, then do that. But if they don't take you to another place, you got a place to go. And so it's still not going to be perfect the first time, but they're going to be much closer to doing something that has uh, a sinew that is, uh, has a thread to it and it's performed with a grace. This is Music Business Radio, your backstage pass to the music business, and I'm here with Bill Kakmus. He's a performance coach, media consultant, and show doctor. You've also got a description on your website, kakmus.com. That I'm kind of curious about. Years ago, one of the first shows that American Idol spun off was called All American Girl. If you watch TV now, there's a show called So You Think You Can Dance, which is a spinoff of American Idol. Nigel Lithgow, who was the executive producer uh, for years, up until recently, of American Idol, he was a dancer. He loved dance, and he created the show that he's a judge on now. But that first spinoff, All American Girl had some problems, and one of the problems was Nigel called me and said, Bill, I've got a host problem. Not unlike when Dick Clark called me and said, I have a host problem. I said, Nigel, what's your problem? He said, you know what? You're just going to have to come and see it. And they all say that. So I came and saw, 
We sat there in the audience, and while they're taping, the host that they hired was hosting a show of 14 to 17-year-old girls who would do a talent. And just like American Idol, there would be three judges, and there would be a host, and it would be the same format. But mind you, they're girls from 14 to 17 years old. What this host would do, after a 14-year-old girl would do her little number, whatever talent she had, this host would talk to her. And when th- this little girl walked by, this host would look at her in, let's say, a lascivious manner. And Nigel would look at me and go, fix that. Go up there and fix that. So they would stop taping. They would stop audio. I would walk up on stage and talk to this guy in a very low voice and go, what are you doing? He said, what do you mean? I said, you can't look at that girl's body like that when she walks by. She's 14. And the guy said, what am I supposed to look at? I said, her face. Her father is sitting in the audience. There are 30 million people watching. What are you, insane? And he said, fine. And then he would be okay for about an hour, and then he would become a jerk again. So Nigel was telling me every hour, go up there and fix it. At the end of the week, I had to leave. Uh, I had another client. And Nigel pulled me aside, and Nigel said, listen, thank you so much. You did a great job with this guy. He actually got better. And Nigel said, but I'm going to have to apologize to you because I said something about you I should not have said. I said, Nigel, what did you say? And he said, well, Fox, the network, came in, and they saw you up there. Now, if you know anything about productions, producers are paid by studios to put on a show, and producers never want the studio to know there's a problem. So I'm always getting called in through the back door to fix things so the studio doesn't know there's a problem. You'll never see my name anywhere. So Nigel says, the network came in, Fox came in, they saw you standing on stage, and they came up to me, and they were upset, and they said, who's this guy talking to our host? And Nigel said, I'm so sorry, Bill, I didn't know what to say. I said, so what did you say? Nigel said, it just came out. I said, Nigel. He said, I said you were a host whisperer. I said, excuse me? He said, I said you were a host whisperer. I didn't know what else to say. And I said, Nigel, I kind of like that. And he said, oh, thank goodness. I said, I'm going to put that on my website. He said, great. So if you go on my website, you'll see one of the things on there is host whisperer given to me by Nigel Lithgow. (laughs) Well, speaking of hosts, because I am one and you are the host whisperer, I know producer Gary Crane is dying to know We'll just do Dave's. You know, we normally do a thing called Dave's Demo Derby. Okay. Where music business radio listeners from around the world get critiques. I'm, I'm going to actually have it Dave's Demo Derby. You're going to critique this show. What is it that me, David, needs to improve about my hosting abilities? So what you're doing is asking me to tank my whole interview by telling you things, <laughs> and you're going to say, you know what, I'm not even putting this interview on the air because this guy just trashed me. <laughs> <laughs> so, because we'll I edit it out, <laughs> I could start off by saying, you know, there is a bagel shop down the street that has a help wanted sign, and you might want to, you know, go over there and take a look at that. I'm just kidding. Um, the thing that I like about you and what you've done is that with our telephone pre interview, with our interview before we came in, we sat down, you talked to me like a real human being. Many hosts don't do that, they don't even want to know the person. They just get a sheet from the uh, promotions people, the PR people, and they go, okay, this is the questions I need to ask. They ask them, and then they're done. You make it real and you make it human. So that's it's a fantastic thing, and it helps uh, at least me, and I think it helps interviewees be better at who they are. If I were to suggest anything, people can't see a radio interview, so they don't realize. If they saw this room, they would see that you've got your uh, fantastic audio person, you've got your fantastic producer. They're both sitting at my level. And so I can look at them, and I can have a, a relationship with them, right? You are so tall. And you stand up during this interview. In the corner. So I have to not only look up at you, but I have to look up at you through that mic. And so it becomes very hard to relate to people like that. And if anybody thinks about it in life, you know, if you're at a party and you're having to look up, you know, if you're five foot tall and you're having to look at an eight foot person, it's very difficult to have that kind of a conversation. And so sitting here. You know, I'm, you know, in a seated position. I may be four foot tall. Standing, you're what, fifteen feet? I don't know. You're tall, pretty close. <laughs> so it beca- it's a little difficult to communicate. That's great advice. Yeah, <laughs> which you won't take. No, we're, no I'm sure the next show there's going to be a chair right here, and 
maybe a couch even, so we can even get more relaxed. Well, it, it just it makes it a lot easier for people yeah. to see you at eye level and communicate with That's you. That's fantastic advice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I, I appreciate that. And you're available for musicians, politicians that are listening, actors. You, you work with all aspects. Of I work with actors, business. anchors, doctors, lawyers, athletes, politicians. I work with all kinds of performers. And uh, n- the reason I love Nashville is my base is here, and it's an entertainment-based city. And I love to work with uh, all of those different professions because it makes my job fun. And you work on interview techniques, body language, storytelling, how to understand an audience, read an audience, speaking in sound bites. Politicians love that one. Yes, exactly. So the website is cacmis.com, C-A-K-M-I-S.com. There's all sorts of information there. There's a mailing list. You're on Twitter. I am in, on all of those things, yes. <laughs> so more information about all of this that we've been talking about and how it can help your music business career, cacmis.com. You got time for one more story? Yeah, sure. I can tell you something about someone we all probably know and love is uh, Robin Williams. I worked with Robin years ago with an improv group in Los Angeles called Off the Wall. He was a part of that group at that time, very young uh, comedian. And one of the things that the other improvisationalists would, would come up to me because I was helping to direct that, and they would come up to me and they say, I can't be on stage with Robin. And I would say, why? And one guy said it perfectly. He said, it's like a comedy wind tunnel. He said, you have to run as fast as you can just to stand in one place with this guy. And I said, then start running because he's a very talented man. The things, though, about Robin, we were talking earlier, you think on any given night when you watch Robin is you go, how does this guy come up with this stuff? But if you watch Robin five nights in a row, it's the same thing. It's the same jokes. He'll dance around a joke. He'll improvise around it. But at the end of the day, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. He knows the character, and he knows how to do it because he's done it a thousand times. So one of the reasons I'm, I'm telling you that is because when I'm working with people, what I communicate to them is that rehearsal is everything. Prep is everything. And don't think if you do it too many times, it's going to lose its freshness. No. The more you rehearse, the more you prep, the fresher you can make something look because you're confident in it. And that's Robin. Now, <clears throat> another quick story I'll tell you about Robin is, is there are performers who are very small. You have to make them big. Robin is a guy that when you talk to him in life, you have to get five inches away from him to hear him because he's very quiet. But when he gets in front of a camera, when he gets on stage, man, he's all over the place. And that's his talent. However, when he does a film... If you'll notice, the best films he does are the directors who tamp him down, who make him do very little, because there is so much there that when he does it big, he did a movie called Popeye that went into the ground because they let him do whatever he wanted, and it was too much. So watch the shows that Robin does, the the films that Robin does, where uh, he's quiet. Those are the films that get awards, and those are the films where people think he's just an incredible actor. And he is, because it doesn't take much. He's got so much talent. So you've got to know performers to know when to tamp them down or when to just open up all the valves and let them fly. And that's what you do. That's what I do. And you're available to work with musicians at cactmus.com. Bill, I appreciate you being here. This is fantastic. It's a different perspective that I think is going to be very helpful. I really enjoyed the day. David, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. For more from us, check us out online at musicbusinessradio.com. I'll see you next week when I'll interview another industry guest. Thanks for listening to Music Business Radio, a production of Tuned In Broadcasting Incorporated, Nashville, Tennessee. Recorded in the WRLT Lightning 100 studios. Music Business Radio is produced by Gary Crane, David Hooper, and Dan Buckley. Special technical assistance by Tom Hansen. With Pro Tools post-production by Justin Hamill and Dan Buckley. And Lester held the antenna. For information on syndication, guest booking, demo derby music, or downloading previous episodes, visit musicbusinessradio.com. Music. Business. Radio.